श्रीमते मामेन्तिनामिने नमस्ते सारस्वते देवे गौरवानी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषा शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे नमो महावदन्याय कृष्ण प्रेम प्रदायते कृष्णाय कृष्ण चैतन्य नामने गौरधे नम हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधो दीनबंधो जगत्पते गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमोस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादी गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण ओके सो वेलकम एवरीवन सो एवरीवन कैन टेल वन पॉइंट व्हाट यू स्टडी फ्रॉम यस्टरडे वन पॉइंट व्हाट यू रिमेंबर हाँ बोलो एंड हाउ टू डेवलप ग्रेटफुलनेस ओके सो व्हाई इट इज रिक्वायर्ड से वन टू पॉइंट्स मेनी पॉइंट्स वेर मेड बट व्हेन ग्रेटफुलनेस लीड्स टू ह्यूमिलिटी ग्रेटफुलनेस लीड्स अस टू मेक्स अस अप्रिशिएट व्हाट वी हैव सो वी वोंट टेक इट कैजुअली ओके ओके गुड पॉइंट्स थैंक यू यस रघु ग्रुप अप्रो आई नो यू यू टेल वन पॉइंट यू टेल Okay. In the meantime, you want to say this? Hmm. Okay. Good point. Yes, we discussed about determination. Yes, uh, Ram Sekhar, you remember something? the mercy of his spiritual master he performed so much penances he was able to choke by his austerity the all the living entities in the three worlds were getting choked mm. up mm. so that is the energy of the lord mm. so how the devotee also become so powerful correct okay good thank you uh anyway you have the mic you speak yesterday we also discussed that how association uh this uh, the point we were discussing that how we should practice krishna con in the association of devotees that mm. is very much required mm. and although the discussion was going on that how dhruva maharaj case mm. that uh, he he could do it without uh, mm. association but mm. then it came out oh, nicely mm. that how he was always in the association of devotees because he was mm. carrying the instruction of the spiritual master okay uh, association of devotees uh, so important but uh, uh, we um, taking association that devotee devotee also uh, that devotee also means uh, determined like dhruva maharaj mm, okay good point ha uh. uh, we see in the case of dhruva maharaj that he got a darshan of the lord mm. so even after having darshan of the lord mm. what is aspiring for the association of you know his i mean the devotees yes so how uh, association of devotees is the uh, main thing what mm. devotee aspires for and you were mm. also seeing from the purports that how association of devotees is required for maturing mm. so that ripe mango and Um, ripe mango. Mm. The association of the devotees only makes it ripe. Actually, correct. Raw mango becomes ripe mango. Right. Good. You want to share any points? Shankaran Pru, Rukmini Vala Pru. Can develop gratitude by meditation and association. Okay. Good. Please say something. No. See. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So we'll proceed ahead with the next section. The next section. okay so we finished till verse number twenty five twenty five we finished so we'll proceed ahead now text twenty six om namo bhagavate vasudevaya ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ 
ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम शैव नरोत्तम देव सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय मुदीर the great sage maitre said after being worshiped and honored by the boy dhru maharaj and after offering him his abode lord vishnu on the back of garuda returned to his abode as dhru maharaj looked on 27 so dhru, um, the lord gave the benedictions to dhru maharaj that will get the pole star and um, uh, stepmother suruchi would die and then uttam also would be killed and then he in this way he benedicted dhruva and he left to the spiritual abode text 27 despite having achieved the desired result of his determination by worshiping the lotus feet of the lord dhruva maharaj was not very pleased thus he returned to his home so so even though dhruva maharaj got all his desires fulfilled but still he was not pleased So Prabhupada writes in the last sentence of this purport, rather he was ashamed that he had demanded something from the Lord, for he should not have done this. Sri Vidura inquired, "My dear Brahmana, the abode of the Lord is very difficult to attain. It can be attained only by pure devotional service, which alone pleases the most affectionate, merciful Lord." Dhruva Maharaj achieved this position even in one life, and he was very wise and conscientious. Why then? was he not very pleased okay so that was the question vidura is asking so in spite of getting everything whatever he wanted why was dhruva not pleased text 29 maitreya uvacha matu sapatnya bagbane ridhi vidhastu tan smaran naichan mukti pater muktim tasma tapam upeyu upeyavan Maitreya answered, "Dhruva Maharaj's heart, which was pierced by the arrows of the harsh words of his stepmother, was greatly aggrieved. And thus, when he fixed upon his goal of life, and thus when he fixed upon his goal of life, he did not forget her misbehavior. He did not demand actual liberation from this material world, but at the end of his devotional service, when the supreme personality of God had appeared before him, he was simply ashamed." of the material demands he had in his mind so vagbanir so we had discussed on this point how the words of suruchi were like sharp arrows which broke the heart and mind of dhruva which was like an earthen pot and so he was remembering those words and therefore he wanted to get a kingdom greater than his great grandfather so but then later on uh, he became very much ashamed tapam tapam upeyivan so now he having realized what i have achieved what i have desired so therefore he is undergoing great distress tapam because of those material desires with which he approached the supreme lord the supreme lord is described as mukti pate the lord can give mukti but dhruva is thinking i am so unfortunate i did not desire for mukti rather i simply desired some material things shil prabha writes in the purport this important verse has been discussed by many stalwart commentators why was dhruva maharaj not very pleased even after achieving the goal of life he desired we'll read a few important sentences from shil prabha's quite a long purport in the material world one's material desires are all most demoniac one thinks of others as one's enemies one thinks of revenge against one's enemies one aspires to become the topmost leader or topmost person in this material world and thus one competes with all others so in this way one has all these material desires a pure devotee has no demand from the lord his only concern is to serve the lord sincerely and seriously and he is not at all concerned about what will happen in the future so that's the pure devotee he has no demands from the lord he is only 
thinking, how can I please the Lord? And for that, he acts sincerely and seriously. And then Prabhupada is quoting from the Shikshashtakam, Nadhanam Janam Sundari. Further down in the next paragraph, Prabhupada writes, mm. talking about the pure devotee, the pure devotee also does not want liberation. So he, uh, the pure devotee doesn't want any material things, but he also does not want liberation. He's a soul completely surrendered to the Supreme Lord and he does not demand anything from the Lord. This position was realized by Dhruva Maharaj when he saw the Supreme Personality of God at present personally before him because he was elevated to the Vasudev platform. The Vasudev platform refers to the stage at which material contamination is conspicuous by absence only or in other words, where there's no question of the material modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And one can therefore see the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because on the Vasudev platform, one can see God face to face. The Lord is also called Vasudev. So there's the Vasudev platform, where one is totally free from the influence of three modes. And uh, so Dhruva Maharaj achieved that platform, the Vasudev platform. He's seeing the Supreme Lord face to face. And so at that point of time, all his material desires, everything vanished. Hmm. Further down in the next paragraph, Prabhupada writes, um, although the motive might be impure, the Lord does not consider the motive. He is concerned with the service. But if a devotee has a particular motive, the Lord directly or indirectly knows it. And therefore, he does not leave the devotee's material desires unfulfilled. These are the, some of the special favors by the Lord to a devotee. So if the devotee has some material desires, so the Lord can fulfill those material desires also. Mm -hmm. If the Lord is pleased with the service. Dhruva Maharaj was offered Dhruva Loka, a planet that was never resided upon by any conditioned soul. Even Brahma, although the topmost living creature within the, this universe, was not allowed to enter the Dhruva Loka. So in this way, he achieved a planet greater than even Brahma. Next paragraph. Here in this verse, the Lord is described as Mukti Pati, which means one under whose lotus feet there are all kinds of Mukti. And then Prabhupada talks about the five types of Mukti. And, uh, and then in the next paragraph, he writes that how the Vaishnava philosophers do not accept Sayuja Mukti to be within the category of Mukti. According to them, Mukti means transferal to the loving service of the Lord from one's position of serving Maya. Lord Chaitanya also says in this connection that the constitutional position of a living entity is to render service to the Lord. That is real Mukti. What's the verse? Swarupena Vyavastiti. When one is situated in his original position, giving up artificial positions, he is called mukta or liberated. Further down, Srila Prabhupada Saraswati says that if one is elevated to real pure devotional service, he considers even great demigods like Brahma and Indra to be on an equal level with an insignificant insect. So, the devotee is not all interested in all these big, big posts and positions, even post of Brahma, Indra, he's not interested. So he considers them totally insignificant because he's simply interested in the loving devotional service to the Lord. The reason is that an insignificant insect has a desire for sense gratification and even a great personality like Lord Brahma also wants to dominate this material nature. So the mentality is the same. And that is what the devotee does not want. Sense gratification means domination over material nature. So that is basically what happens in the material world. And then he talks about the scientists. They think that this is the advancement of human civilization. The more they can dominate material laws, the more advanced they think they are. But of course, what they can do. Um, it is like Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sustanko telling the story of the frog who was trying to challenge the elephant hmm, with his one rupee coin. You, you all know that story, correct? You know? Ah, uh -huh, yes. So, so the frog was thinking, I'm so powerful, I got a one rupee coin. But then what is his power in front of the elephant? So similarly, the scientists are thinking that they're very powerful with all their advancement. 
and uh, how much ever powerful one may be in the material sense in front of the forces of material nature what is the significance of the insignificant living entity so insignificant prabhupada in his lectures also he says um the lord can create one cyclone or some flood anything he can do and within moments one can be finished what is one's power so it is only simply due to illusion one thinks that i'm great i can do wonderful things and so therefore finally he realized that he had wanted a few part particles of broken glass but instead had received many diamonds when dhruv maharaj became situated on the vasudev platform due to seeing the lord face to face all his material contamination was cleared thus he became ashamed of what his demands were and what he had achieved so at this point of time he became ashamed what did i ask for so these were the causes of his moroseness further down he used the word vedaham because when dhruv maharaj demanded material benefits the lord was present within his heart and so he knew everything vedaham samatitani vartmanane ch arjuna bhavishyani ch bhutani mam tu vedana kashchana so the lord knows everything past present future the lord knows what what happened in our past this life previous unlimited lives also the lord knows everything and so therefore the we cannot hide anything from the lord and so the lord knows everything and if the lord wants he can fulfill those desires and so therefore we have to know that ultimately whatever happens in our life is simply the reactions of what one is getting in the in the past what one has done in the past so uh, the lord always knows everything a man is thinking even what one is thinking the lord knows what can one hide from the lord mm -hmm. one things i can do this i can do that nobody is watching nobody is seeing i'll hide here i'll hide there but what can one hide uh, even one's thoughts one cannot hide from the lord the lord knows even what one is thinking mm -hmm. so these are some realities of life one has to accept uh, and so when one understands these facts then one is extremely careful every thought one is thinking every word one is speaking every action one is doing everything one is very very extremely careful because one knows there is the supreme witness watching and i cannot hide anything from him okay okay here we have uh, vishnu chakravarty's commentary on the verse please read manishinya the wise say that the liberation was liberation means becoming an associate of the lord and serving vishnu par padma purana this thus mukti or liberation on this verse does not meaning merging into the lord in verse 9 dhruva expressed his preference for serving the lord over brahman but then the statement he did not desire this liberation is not suitable it is understood that he desired being an associate of the lord from his statement in verse 11 this is true the word smaran remembering is the is the present tense this indicates that he did not desire the lord's association while remembering his impure state of experiencing the pain of the arrows of his step mother's words he went to madhavan and performed austerities with the determination to worship the lord with the desire to obtain a place greater than his father or forefathers next on directly meeting the lord what is the question of remembering the harsh words of his stepmother since his senses had all become spiritualized however the lord then said that he would fulfill his material desire through became ashamed and repented my lord knows my crime of possessing material desire since he remembers my previous vow i am so foolish why did i make such a vow when i said i desired the association of the devotees the lord will think i am simply deceiving him thus he did not clearly promise to fulfill that desire but instead promised to fulfill my previous desire 
in talking about the future of my brother he reminded me again of my previous envious nature thus the next six verses reveal qualities of same repentance humility and disgust okay so this is what dhruva realized after he had darshan of the lord he came to the purified platform then he realized i committed a crime by possessing all these material desires hmm. and so the lord rather than fulfilling the desire to have the association of devotees and have prema he fulfilled my previous desire of getting a kingdom greater than my forefathers and then also the desire of taking revenge against his step mother and step brother so all those desires he fulfilled and so now dhruva is greatly uh, lamenting he is repenting and so of course such repentance is uh, helpful in the nectar of devotion also shila prabhupad speaks about three types of vigyapti or submission to the lord what are they and may remembers three types of vigyapti sam prarthnatmika daina bodhika and dal samay goods so the second category is dainya bodhika so dainya bodhika prayers are prayers expressing one's uh, humility one's repentance so that is um that is one of the type of prayers and shil prabhu says yes that is required that is essential that one goes before the lord and uh, repents for one's past misdeeds for all the wrong activities desires one has had in the past so that type of repentance is uh, essential so that one always remains on the platform of humility thinking that uh, what was my past it was not that i dropped from the sky as a pure devotee i have had so many material desires so many wrong doings so much nonsense have i done and so in that state of humility one sincerely repents in front of the lord and then that will give one the impetus not to commit those wrong activities again in the future and also by that one can continue to remain in the humble position and that is why the acharyas show by their own example they just like bhakti vinod thakur sings amar jeevan sada paapi ratha nahi ko punye ralesha so in like these by singing such songs the acharyas are showing through the example that how one can always remain in a humble state of mind thinking oneself totally insignificant and thus that creates a conducive platform for going ahead in the practice of devotional service on the platform of true humility and thus we find that dhruv maharaj at this point of time he is feeling great remorse and great uh shamefulness for what he desired and not only just desired but the lord agreed to fulfill those material desires not immediately giving him pure love and the association of pure devotees and thus he is feeling uh, very humble and disgusted with what he desired and in that mood he is speaking the next six verses ध्रुव उवाच सामनाकन यदम विदु सनंदय ऊर्धरेत सह मेरह शीरमुष्य पादयोषायापेद्यापगत पृथन्मती ध्रुव ध्रुव महाराज थॉट टू हिमसेल्फ to endeavor to be situated in the shade of the lotus feet of the lord is not an ordinary task because even the great brahmacharis headed by sanandana who practice ashtanga yoga in trance attain the shelter of the lord's lotus feet only after many many births within 6 months i achieved the same result yet due to my thinking differently from the lord i fell down from my position okay so dhramaraj is saying that this position what i achieved within 6 months is so rare hmm? it is so rare that even great devotees urdhva retasa those who are infallible celibates hmm? like sananda adaya 
So even they can could not achieve within just six months. Ma se raham shadbir, but but still, I could not get the ultimate result. Why? Because prithak mati, prithak mati. Because I had my mind was fixed on something else other than the Lord. So it's very important that once mind is fixed on the lotus feet of the Lord. without any deviation without any other desires just like in the third canto of the shrimad bhagavatam lord kapila is speaking about uh, devotional service mixed with the three modes so when devotional service is mixed with the three modes then there are various desires various qualities that manifest and there also the mm, similar word is used bhinnadrik mm, bhinnadrik that means having a separate mentality other than the mentality to achieve the lord to please the lord and so therefore one always has to be meditating on this fact how can i always please the lord how can i always please my spiritual master shri prabhupada says in one lecture that at every point of time one can always be meditating before doing anything before thinking anything one can always be meditating if my spiritual master were present right here in front of me what would he think about my acts what would be he be thinking about my actions if he were present right here in front of me so that will keep us always on track otherwise the tendency of the mind is to think something separate because of the deep conditionings since time immemorial for sense gratification and so therefore the tendency of the mind is prithakmati to think something other than the lord and the pleasure of the lord but if one is always focusing on this point how can i always please then one can always remain on track and so therefore dhruv maharaj is lamenting although i achieved something so great within such a short time but because of this prithakmati because of thinking something other than the lord therefore i could not achieve the ultimate goal of life purport in this verse dhruv maharaj himself explains the cause of his moroseness first he laments that to see the supreme personality of god directly is not easy even the four kumaras practice yoga system for many many births and remain in trance before getting the opportunity to see the supreme lord face to face he expected therefore that as soon as he met the supreme lord the lord would take him to his abode immediately without waiting that is what he thought now the lord has appeared he will take me to his abode but that didn't happen he told wait on this earthly planet for 36000 years and then dhruva loka so therefore he is repenting dhruva maharaj greatly lamented his propensity for ruling the material world and his revengeful attitude towards other living entities text hmm. thirty one aho bata mamanatmyam mandha bhagyasya pashyata उटिशनेट therefore uh, yache antavat therefore i prayed for something which is antavat something which is perishable something which is temporary even though the supreme lord appeared so uh, so the supreme lord who can bhavachiddha who can immediately cut the repetition of birth and death but i did not get that rather i got something perishable something temporary so prabhupada writes the word anatmyam is very significant in this verse atma means the soul and anatmyam means without any conception of the soul okay so the person who is in ignorance then he gets attracted to all these material things and uh, 
So Dhruva Maharaj regrets his unfortunate position, for although he approached the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is always able to give his devotee the highest benediction of cessation of the reputation of birth and death, which is impossible for any demigod to offer, he foolishly wanted something perishable. So, therefore, we also have to understand what is the great opportunity we have in this Kali Yuga especially, when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has descended and has given such an easy process by which we can attain perfection. And simply by the chanting of the holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Simply by such an easy process, no need of uh, very difficult austerities, no need of uh, fasting like Dhruva. Mm, we can eat Mahaprasad three times a day, no problem. Mm. Simply chanting and dancing and feasting, such a simple process. Uh, simply sitting, Prabhupada in some lectures he says, one simply has to come, sit down in the class, here, and then there is Prasad. Uh, simply chant, dance, when you're hungry, take Prasad, that's all. Such a simple process. Uh, so we have the great opportunity for this. Achieving the highest perfection. But if we don't take advantage, then that is a very unfortunate position. Manda Bhagyasya. Very unfortunate. We have the opportunity for the highest perfection. But if we don't take it seriously, then we'll be simply unfortunate. And later on, we may have to repent like Dhruva Maharaj. Uh, what have I done? So many years have passed. So many years have passed, but I'm still not serious in the practice of devotional service. Uh, so one may have to repent like that. So therefore, before it becomes too late, at any point of time, this body can be taken away. At any point of time, there is no guarantee. And so therefore, one has to be always prepared to achieve the highest perfection. So therefore, better late than never. And uh, um, yes, so here we find that Dhruva Maharaj is expressing his Manda Bhagyasya. Harim Vinana Shritim Taranti. It is said that without the blessings of Hari, the Supreme Personality of God, it, no one can stop the continuous chain of birth and death within this material world. Therefore, the Supreme Lord is also called as Bhavachitta. The Vaishnava philosophy in the process of Krishna consciousness prohibits the devotee from all kinds of material aspiration. Hmm. So, material aspirations. Here we find Dhru Maharaj, he is lamenting even though he got so much and then sometimes we get caught up in petty desires and petty things of this material world, getting some petty posts and positions and some honor, prestige of this world. Such petty desires one has. Rather than desiring the pure devotional service, one gets caught up with some petty desires, insignificant desires, which are going to vanish with time like bubbles in the ocean. So therefore, one has to understand that this is not what one should aspire for. The only thing worth aspiring for is pure devotional service. Dhruva Maharaj regrets that although he was initiated in the Vishnu Mantra by Vaishnav, he still aspired for material benefits. That was another cause for lamentation. And then Prabhupada is giving an instruction for every devotee in the end of his purports. What is that? In other words, every one of us who is engaged in devotional service and Krishna consciousness should be completely free from all material aspirations. Otherwise, we will have to lament like Dhruva Maharaj. Uh, Prabhupada is giving an instruction for all of us. What is that? We should be completely free from all material aspirations. Whether we want to follow it or not is up to every individual. Choice is ours. The choice is always there. 
Otherwise, yes, we will have to lament like Dhruva Maharaj. Hmm. Text 32. Matir vidushita devaye patad patad bhir asahishnu bhi yo narada vachastatyam nagrahisham asattamaha. Since all the demigods are situated in the higher planetary system, will have to come down again. They are all envious of my being elevated to Vaikuntha Loka by devotional service. These intolerant demigods have dissipated my intelligence. And only for this reason could I not accept the genuine benediction of the instructions of sage Narad. So here, Vishma Chakdakur says, Dhruva imagines the cause of his ignorance. So he is sort of, you could say, imagining or He's saying probably, probably, probably this may be the cause why I became covered by this ignorance because maybe the demigods, they are also envious because they cannot go to the spiritual world. So they are also envious that this person is going to go back to the spiritual world. So they are also envious and therefore um, they planted these material desires and so therefore they have uh, dissipated my intelligence and that is why I desired all this material things. So Prabhupada is explaining how when a, when a person undergoes severe austerities, the demigods become very perturbed because they're always afraid of losing their posts as the predominant, predominating deities of the heavenly planets. And then he explains how the demigods are con controlling the various parts of the body. And so therefore, Dhruva Maharaj's conclusion is that these demigods being envious of his superior position in devotional service conspired against him to pollute his intelligence. And thus, although he was the disciple of a great Vaishnava Narad Muni, he could not accept Narada's valid instruction. Dhruva Maharaj regretted that he had rejected the advice of Narad Muni and was adamant in asking him for something perishable, namely revenge against his stepmother for her insult and the possession of the kingdom of his father. Text 33. Devim Maya Mubashritya Prasupta Eva Bhinna Drik Tapye Dviti Yapyasati Bhatra Bhatra Vya Ridruja. Dhruva Maharaj lamented. Read. Dhruva Maharaj lamented. I was under the influence of the illusory energy, being ignorant of the actual facts. I was sleeping on, the, on her lap under a vision of duality. I saw my brother as my enemy and falsely I lamented within my heart thinking they are my enemies. Okay, so in this way he says that I was influenced by Maya Mupashritya. So I took shelter of Maya sleeping on a lap. Maya Mupashritya and therefore Bhinnadrik. Therefore I had a separate vision and therefore I was desiring for something which is Asati, which was temporary. And I was seeing my bratra, my brother, as bratravya, as an enemy. So he's lamenting. I saw my brother as an enemy. I desired revenge. I desired that they be killed. So all this I was, this perception was all due to mayam upashritya, because of the influence of the illusory energy. Purport, real knowledge is revealed to a devotee only when he comes to the right conclusion about life by the grace of the Lord. So the knowledge comes by the grace of the Lord. So I think in a previous class also we had discussed this point about Gyan and Vigyan. So beautiful purport in the Bhagavad Gita 6.8 where Srila Prabhupada explains about Gyan and Vigyan. So one can have Gyan, theoretical knowledge, bookish knowledge. Srila Prabhupada begins that purport by saying bookish knowledge without realization is useless. So therefore one needs the bookish knowledge but one that knowledge has to transform into realization by which one can practice the knowledge. And that realization takes place by the grace of the Lord when the Lord is pleased with the devotee's service attitudes. So, so that is the meaning of real knowledge. So bookish knowledge can be there. 
but without the grace of the lord the knowledge doesn't turn into realization and then one won't have the determination to live a life on the basis of that knowledge so therefore he says real knowledge is revealed it's a matter of revelation when he comes to the right conclusion about life by the grace of the lord and then he's speaking about a creation of friends and enemies within this material world is something like dreaming at nights although we are apparently awake in material life because we have no information of the soul and the super soul we create many friends and enemies simply out of imagination shri krishnadas kavraj goswami says that within this material world or material consciousness good and bad are the same bhadra dvaite dvaite bhadra abhadra sab manodharma so it's all mental concoction distinction between good and bad is simply a mental concoction the actual fact is that all living entities are sons of god or by products of his marginal energy because of our being contaminated by the modes of material nature we distinguish one spiritual spark from another that is also another kind of dreaming it was the end of the purport either materially or spiritually we are basically one but we make friends and enemies as dictated by the illusory energy shri prabhupad also explains what is friend and enemy somebody may be friend now tomorrow he may be enemy so it is all on the material platform it's simply our mental concoction somebody is favorable to my sense gratification he becomes a friend somebody is not favorable he becomes enemy and so therefore such a conception is simply on the bodily platform when one rises to the spiritual platform and sees everyone as spirit souls then even though somebody may behave inimically one understands that this is only due to my past mistakes that somebody is behaving inimically towards me and so therefore this is all temporary Therefore, Shri Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter twelve, verses thirteen and fourteen. He writes uh, that uh, a devotee does not become his enemy's enemy. So, somebody is acting inimically towards me, but I, it does not mean that I also act inimically towards him. So, therefore, one understands that this is simply on the bodily conception of life. That's what Prahlad Maharaj also says. in this famous verse 7512 okay that's the translation please read when the supreme personality of god is pleased with living entity because of his devotional service one becomes a pandita and does not make distinctions between enemies friends and himself intelligently he then thinks every one of us is an eternal servant of god and therefore we are not different from one another purport when prahlad maharaj uh, prahlad maharaj teachers and demonic father asked him how his intelligence had been polluted prahlad maharaj said as far as i am concerned my intelligence has not been polluted rather by the grace of my spiritual master and by the grace of my lord krishna i have now i have now learned that no one is my enemy and no one is my friend we are all actually eternal servants of krishna but under the influence of external energy we think that we are separately situated from the supreme personality of godhead as friends and enemies of one another this mistaken idea has now been corrected and therefore unlike ordinary human beings i no longer think that i am god and that others are my friends and enemies now i am rightly thinking that everyone is an eternal servant of god and that our duty is to serve the supreme master for then we shall stand on the platform of oneness as servants next when the supreme demons think of everyone as friend or enemy but vaishnavas say that since everyone is servant of lord everyone is on the same platform therefore a vaishnava treats other living entities neither as friends nor as enemies but instead tries to spread krishna consciousness teaching everyone that we are all one as servants of the supreme lord but are uselessly wasting our valuable lives by creating nations communities and other groups of friends and enemies 
everyone should come to the platform of krishna consciousness and thus feel oneness a servant of lord although there are 84 lakhs of species of life a vaishnava feels this oneness the ishopanishad advises ekatvam anupashyataha a devotee should see the supreme personality of godhead to be situated in everyone's heart and should also see every living entities as an eternal servant of the lord this vision is called ekatvam oneness although there is relationship of master and servant both master and servant are one because of their spiritual identity this is also ekatvam thus the conception of ekatvam for the vaishnava is different from that of the mayavadi the last paragraph of this purport is very important especially for devotees everyone should be friendly for service of the lord everyone should praise another service to the lord and not to be proud of his own service this is the way of vaishnava thinking vaikuntha thinking there may be rivalries and apparent competition between servants in performing service but in the vaikuntha planet the service of another servant is appreciated not condemned this is vaikuntha competition there is no question of enemy between servants everyone should be allowed to render service to the lord to the best of his ability and everyone should appreciate the service of others such are the activities of vaikuntha since everyone is servant everyone is on the same platform and is allowed to serve the lord according to his ability as confirmed in bhagavad gita 15.15 sarvasya chaham hridi sannivishto matta smritir gyanam apohanam cha the lord is situated in everyone's heart giving direction giving dictation according to the attitude of the servant however the lord gives different dictation to the non devotees and devotees the non devotees challenge the authority of the supreme lord and therefore the lord dictates in such a way that the non devotees forget the lord's service life after life and are punished by the laws of nature but when a devotee very sincerely wants to render service to the lord the lord dictates in a different way okay so here <clears throat> pralad maharaj is giving some very important uh, instructions and that is how a vaishnav he sees everyone as a spirit soul servant of god and so therefore he sees oneness on that platform ekatvam anupashyati as the ishopanishad also says and so therefore even as devotees prabhupada is saying that everyone sees everyone else as a servant serving the lord and so therefore there is no question of somebody being superior somebody being inferior there is no superiority inferiority on the spiritual platform everyone is simply rendering service whether one is uh, as prabhupada in many lectures he says whether one is on the altar worshiping the lord or whether one is sweeping the floor it is the same everyone is simply rendering service that's what prabhupada is saying here everyone should be allowed to render service to the lord to best of his ability and everyone should appreciate the service of others such are the activities of vaikuntha since everyone is a servant everyone is on the same platform allowed to serve the lord according to his ability so somebody's ability may be more somebody's ability may be less but if one according to his ability is rendering service sincerely then that is a, that needs to be appreciated and that is definitely appreciated by the lord also and the lord reciprocates accordingly and so therefore there is nothing as superior service inferior service not that just because somebody has some post and position he becomes superior somebody does not have it he becomes inferior the service is better no even if one is uh, a spiritual master having disciples then the spiritual master also thinks i am simply servant of my disciples and so ultimately everyone is a servant everyone is rendering different service according to his ability and according to what the lord desires and so if one understands that then everyone can be totally satisfied rendering any service not that one feels some superiority complex inferiority complex oh he is he is doing this service that service is better he is getting uh, 
he is getting so much of fame so much of followers so much of ma prasad i am not getting anything so one one tends to compare one tends to uh, feel inferior all these things happen because one does not understand the simple points this very simple point which is our fundamental philosophy that is we are all spirit souls and we all have only one upadi what is that one upadi jeevera swarup hoy krishnera nitya das everyone has in after initiation one receives title what das everyone has only one title anybody has been given some different title after initiation ha uh, no even if one has a uh, name mahaprabhu still after that it is das he doesn't become prabhu or mahaprabhu he still das only hmm. therefore sometimes we uh, it is good to write uh, prabhu but then whenever we ha have official officially whenever we write names we should write das that is the title that we have been given hmm. officially we nobody has been given title prabhu correct nobody has given title everyone has been given title das so therefore our name is das and we should remind ourselves we are das hmm. so on that platform there is absolutely no problem absolutely no problem everyone does a service and is content with that service that has been given and he appreciates other service so then everyone can be satisfied nobody superior nobody is inferior okay so and then prophet says then when one has this right attitudes then the lord dictates accordingly so as far as the non devotees are concerned the lord dictates in such a way that they forget the lord prophet in one lecture he says that by the grace of the lord the non devotees write volumes of books so that they forget his existence so that ability to write volumes of books denying the existence of the lord that intelligence also is given by the lord why because they desired it so therefore if he desired to enjoy just like here dhruva maharaj he desired to enjoy then krishna is facilitating that so somebody has a desire for material things even while practicing devotional service dhruva maharaj is practicing devotional service but he has desire for material things then krishna can fulfill those material things and one may actually think one is being successful this was the first class where we, we were discussing the various weeds that grow and one can mistake them to be the bhakti lata so one can think i am getting my material aspirations fulfilled it seems i am making good advancement in devotional service one could mistake that but actually the real progress is how much one is developing one's prema one's attraction towards the lord that is the real advancement and so therefore the lord may simply fulfill those material desires because we desired it and therefore one has to always be very careful to distinguish between the bhakti lata and the upashaka the weeds so here dhruva maharaj is lamenting why did i think my mother my step brother why did i think them to be enemies he is lamenting for that so we'll just complete the section okay please read the translation of the next verse text 34 and uh, 34 and 35 you can read both the translations it is very difficult to satisfy the supreme personality of god it but in my case although i have satisfied the super soul of this whole universe i have prayed only for useless things my activities were exactly like treatment given to a person who is already dead just see how unfortunate i am for in spite of meeting the supreme lord who can cut one's link with birth and death i have prayed for the same conditions again next one because of my state of complete foolishness and paucity of pious activities although the lord offered me his personal service i wanted material name fame and prosperity my case is just like that of a poor man who when he said sat he satisfied a great emperor who wanted to give him anything he might ask out of ignorance asked only a few broken grains of husk rice mm. 
So here he's saying, because of my maudhyat, maudhyat, I became a mudha. Because of being a mudha, I asked for some foolish things. Uh, so I asked for some falikaran, falikaran. So some husk rice, some little bit I asked even though going to a very great person, Ishwarath, I went to the Ishwar, the Parameshwar came, but I asked for something so insignificant. And this was my foolishness. So the first word of the verse is Swarajim. Swarajim. So Vishnu Chaktagar comments on the word Swarajim. He says, it means he who is glorious in himself with bhakti. The Lord gives position of Swarajam. He gives the position of service or Swarajam to his devotee. So to his devotee, the real benediction which the Lord gives is what? Swarajam, service. That is what the Lord gives. So that is the real mercy of the Lord when he gives service. Getting material benefits, that is not real benediction of the Lord. The real benediction is to get service. Mama Janmani Janmani Shware Bhavata Bhakti Ahituki Tvai. That is what the devotee desires, service. And that is the real benediction. Prabhupada writes in the purport complete independence means situation in one's own constitutional position. The real independence of a living entity who is part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is to remain always dependent on the Supreme Lord, just like a child who plays in complete independence guided by his parents who watch over him. The independence of the conditioned soul does not mean to fight with the obstacles offered by Maya, but to surrender to Krishna. Very important statement. The independence of the conditioned soul does not mean to fight with the obstacles offered by Maya, but to surrender to Krishna. Somebody would like to explain the statement? Your realizations on the statements? Yes, Andhadipra? Uh, Harish Haripu shared that uh, past time of Prabhupada, on the sparrow was trying to make a nest and then every time was foiled in her endeavor by Harish Haripu by pulling out that nest and finally plugged in with paper. And then Prabhupada gives the purpose. Similarly, everyone is trying to just fight against the Maya actually to get some, you know, uh, enjoyment in this world. Mm. And when he's completely frustrated, he changes his body and all that. Mm. So uh, generally the endeavor is to overcome Maya's uh, foiling their plan. But actually one should know that I should surrender to Krishna instead. And that yes, is because it is useless trying to fight against the forces of Maya. The force of Maya is so powerful. Devesha gunamai mama maya duratyaya. So what is the use of fighting? with Maya. So therefore, Prabhupada says, what the scientists are doing, the scientists are simply trying to overcome Maya by trying to create some comfortable situation in the material world. That is what the scientists are trying to do. But what, what comfortable situation one can create in this material world? Just impossible. So therefore, it's useless to fight with Maya. Rather, surrender. It's not within my power to fight with Maya. Only when Krishna helps, then only it is possible. Then that is real independence. Then one can be actually independent by surrendering to Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada says, one, when one has surrendered, just like a small child, the small child is sleeping on the lap of the mother, totally peaceful. No anxiety. Why? Because the child knows. I take shelter of my mother. My mother gives me full protection. Of course, then Srila Prabhupada says, but in Kali Yuga, the situation is so degraded, even the same mother is killing the child in the womb. That is the degradation of Kali. But in general, the child takes shelter of the mother and is totally peaceful. So similarly, when one understands it's not within my power to fight against Maya, it's not within my power. What I have to do is surrender. 
So by surrendering to Krishna, by following Krishna's process, then one act can actually be independent. The more one surrenders, the more independence one gains. The example is of Narad Muni, who is totally surrendered, therefore he has full independence. Why he gets more independence? Because Krishna knows that this person will not misuse his independence. So just like in, in the material world also, Prabhupada gives example of children, very naughty child, his independence is taken away. But more obedient child is given more independence, is given more responsibility. So in the same way, the more one is surrendered to the Lord, more one is dependent on the Lord, the more one gets independence. Because the Lord knows he won't misuse the independence. In the material world, everyone is trying to become completely independent simply by fighting against the obstacles offered by Maya. This is called the struggle for existence. Real independence is to be reinstated in the service of the Lord. Anyone who goes to the Vaikuntha planets or Golok Vrindavan planet is freely offering his service to the Lord. That is complete independence. Just contrary to this is material overlordship, which we wrongly take to be independence. So one thinks, I can do whatever I like. I'm independent. The materialistic person thinks, I can drink, I can smoke, I can do whatever I like. I'm independent. Is he independent? No. He's controlled by the mind and senses and he's bound by the three modes. The three modes have tied him and they're making him dance. He's imagining himself to be independent, but actually he's not independent. Hmm? So the real independence is to declare one's dependence on God. Towards the end of the purport, the conclusion is that anyone who's engaged in the loving service of the Lord should never ask for material prosperity from the Lord. The awarding of material prosperity simply depends on the stringent rules and regulations of the external energy. Pure devotees ask the Lord only for the privilege of serving him. Beautiful statement. Pure devotees only ask for the privilege of serving him. So the opportunity to serve the Lord is what? Privilege. Prabhupada says, just like if somebody is given the post of being a personal secretary to the prime minister, one will think it to be a privilege, correct? Now, this is the opportunity to serve the Supreme Lord who is much above all prime ministers and presidents. Such is the privilege. And therefore, this is what we have to consider to be real privilege. Uh, this is our real independence. If we want anything else, it is a sign of our misfortune. So in this connection, next, in this connection, Prahlad Maharaj says, 7, 10, 4. Nanyatha te akila guru gateta karunatmanaha yasta shisha ashaste nasa brithya savaivanik. Please do. Go ahead, go ahead. Otherwise, O oh my Lord, O oh Supreme Instructor of the entire world, you are so kind to your devotee that you could not induce him to do something unbeneficial for him. On the other hand, one who desires some material benefit in exchange for devotional service cannot be your pure devotee. Indeed, he is no better than a merchant who wants profit in exchange for service. Next. Part of the purport. Unless one is pious, one cannot approach the Supreme Personality of Godhead. However, although a pious man may receive some material benefit, one who is concerned with material benefits cannot be a pure devotee. When a pure devotee receives material opulences, this is not because of his pious activity, but for the service of the Lord. When one engages in devotion service, one is automatically pious. Therefore, a pure devotee is Anya Avilashita Shunyam. He has no desire for material profit, nor does the Lord induce him to profit materially. When a devotee needs something, the Supreme Person of God supplies it. Yoga yes. So the devotee is dependent on the Lord and the Lord supplies. Okay, and in the next verse, next, Prahlad Maharaj says, Ashasano Navebrutya Swaminyashisha Atmanaha 
न स्वामी वृत्यत स्वाम्यम इच्छन यो राति चे चाशिष A servant who desires material profits from his master is certainly not a qualified servant or a pure devotee. Similarly, a master who bestows benedictions upon his servant because of a desire to maintain a prestigious position as master is also not a pure master. So here, Pralad Maharaj is giving the definition of who is a pure servant and who is a pure master. So in this way, in this section, Dhruva Maharaj is lamenting for the for approaching the Lord. with material desires and not immediately getting the ultimate privilege of direct service to the lord and prema okay fine so we'll take a break and continue thank you hari krishna वै मुकुंद से पदारविंद रजो जुषस्तादृशा जन वाचंती तदास्यमर्थ अर्थम आत्मनो यदृछयालब्धमन समृद्धय द ग्रेट सेज मै थ्रो ए कंटिन्ूड्स मै डियर विदुरा persons like you who are pure devotees of the lotus feet of mukunda the supreme personality of godhead who can offer liberation and who always attached to the honey of his lotus feet are always satisfied in serving at the lotus feet of the lord in any condition of life such persons remain satisfied and thus they never ask the lord for material prosperity in this way maitre is glorifying vidura who is a pure devotee and so therefore because he simply attached mukundasya padaravindaya so they are simply eager to taste the raja jushaha the dust of the lotus feet of the supreme lord and so therefore they don't desire anything else except the service of the lord vanchanti tad dasyam so the only thing they desire is dasyam and as far as other things are concerned yadrichaya yadrichaya labda mana samruddhaya so they are whatever yadrichaya whatever comes of its own accord they are satisfied with that and mana samruddhaya quite an interesting word so um, in the word to word meaning proper says constrain themselves very rich samruddha so what is the real richness yes the service to the lord that's the real richness others proper says in his lectures the poor man is also poor the rich man is also poor in this material world nobody is actually rich unless one has the devotional service to the lord so therefore proper condemns the daridha narayan seva so he he says that they are thinking that these are poor people therefore we need to serve them but actually poor are also poor rich are also poor why only serve the poor and why only the poor have narayan the rich don't have narayan hmm. so therefore these are all misconceptions the real samriddhi is the dasyam the service to the lord that is the real samriddhi and therefore when a devotee has that the service to the lord he considers himself to be rich and therefore he is satisfied materially speaking whatever is whatever comes of its own accord yadrichaya he is satisfied with that so prabhupada writes in his purport 
when one knows these things perfectly he is always satisfied the pure devotee never hankers after any kind of material prosperity then he speaks about the karmis gyanis yogis he is satisfied in any condition of life as long as he is constantly engaged in the service of the lord the lord's feet are compared to the lotus where there is saffron dust a devotee is always engaged in drinking the honey from the lotus feet of the lord unless one is freed from all material desires he cannot actually taste the honey from the lord's lotus feet unless one is freed from material desires one cannot taste the honey so one has to decide what one wants one wants the honey from the lord's lotus feet or one wants material things one of the two if one wants material things one cannot get that honey so the choice is ours what do we want one has to discharge his devotion duties without being disturbed by the coming and going of material circumstances so material circumstances will change so many changes will take place in the material world but what has to continue is the devotional service sometimes we get too affected by the material circumstances and that creates a disturbance in our practices of devotional service but here but the devotee he tolerates the changes of the material world as prophet says material world one cannot change it is like the waves of the river or the waves of the ocean one cannot stop they will keep on coming going so many changes will take place that's what shri bhakti siddhan sarus thakur told shri prabhupad you are thinking about independence this ruler that ruler these things will keep on changing but one thing that cannot change is krishna consciousness that's the only thing that does not change the only thing that does not change is the spirit soul the supreme lord in the relationship of the of the spirit soul with the supreme lord that's one thing which does not change so if one is fixed on the eternal then even though so many changes can take place in the material situations in the material world one who is fixed one who has taken shelter of the eternal remains fixed then he is not disturbed but one who has not taken firm shelter of the eternal of the eternal truths then he gets very much disturbed by the flickering situations of this material world so therefore the important point is to take shelter of those facts which are eternal and therefore having a firm shelter on the supreme lord a firm shelter on our acharyas shrila prabhupad these are eternal truths which will never change so many things in this material world can change so many people will come so many people will go so many situations will change uh, we are seeing that so many things change we all have experience so many things keep on changing in the material world every day every moment practically things are changing but one thing that cannot change is our eternal relation with krishna so if we take that firm shelter of these eternal truths then whatever material circumstances may change one is not affected by that so the uh, further down prabhat says one has to discharge his devotional service without being disturbed by the coming and going of material circumstances this desirelessness for material prosperity is called nishkam one should not mistakenly think that nishkam means giving up all desires that is impossible and further down he says for a devotee the state of mind nispriha is the right position actually every one of us already has an arrangement for our standard of material comforts a devotee should always remain satisfied with the standard of comforts offered by the lord as stated in the ishopanishad tena tyaktena bhunjita this saves time for executing krishna consciousness so if one is not on this platform of nishkam nispriha then one has desires and one tries to satisfy the desires and one thinks that something is incomplete in my life i have something lacking i need this i need that something is lacking but shila prabhupada writes that beautiful statement in the purport to the invocation to the ishopanishad prabhupada writes all forms of incompleteness are only due to the incomplete knowledge of the complete whole so the only reason we experience some incompleteness 
one thing something is lacking and usually this happens when there's a comparative mentality when one is thinking i'm lacking this he has something more i have something less one compares and then one thinks something is incomplete in me uh, he can sing better he can serve better he can mm, he can eat more prasad mm. so many things he has more i have less so much comparison and one thing something is incomplete but the only cause of such feelings of incompleteness is what incomplete knowledge of the complete whole when one understands krishna is complete his plan is complete everything about the supreme lord is complete the only thing that is incomplete is my understanding of the complete that is the only thing which is incomplete so when one understands this then one can become nispraha one can become nishkam everything is perfect in this world what is happening in my life is perfect and complete what is happening in another's life that is also perfect and complete everything is happening perfectly according to the plan of the lord it's all perfect and complete so what is there to lament what is there to desire nothing on this platform one can be totally peaceful otherwise as long as one is having hankerings i want this i want that then one waste time therefore proper the saying this saves time for executing krishna consciousness so if one understands as far as material things are concerned krishna has given me perfectly according to my quota according to what i deserve if one understands this one can peacefully practice krishna consciousness and not be affected by the changing situations of the material worlds okay maybe we can take one or two questions before proceeding to the next section okay revati putra hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna uh, this is like from the beginning when we started only so proper road in the purport that uh, although the motive was not pure but krishna is concerned with the service not the motive but this is something uh, apparently not matching with what to hear that bhava grahi janardan krishna is more concerned with the bhava and in the case of putna we see that service was not the exact thing but she has some desire to feed milk so krishna kind of took that so how does it like really works because here purpose is krishna concerned with the service not the motive but most often for our own understanding and preaching uh, apart from service we focus because pure devotion service when you offer intentionally not accidentally also and we give so many example like you know the demons they fought with krishna the priest but because the intention was not so then it was not considered uh, pure devotion service so here what was the distinction and how this case worked out to be so different that i mean general we hear like that but apart from service the intention is to be pure okay so pro is asking the question that uh, propad writes krishna considered krishna did not consider the motive he only considered the service that he did okay somebody would like to elaborate on that what does it mean let's hear your thoughts and then we will take the discussion yes one understanding actually krishna is so merciful that he is ready to accept whatever way the if someone is is offering service even if the motive is not correct krishna mercifully accepts that uh, understanding that gradually the motive will become purified and if uh, if someone offers with correct motive then obviously krishna is going to accept so it's a merciful nature of krishna that krishna is ready to accept understanding that uh, as a loving father he, he is ready to accept the offering of sir, gradually the That's okay it. good thank you some other points some of the thoughts on that statement and the proof the primary goal of krishna is to bring back the living entity to his lotus feet so that anichatam that verse comes in the fifth canto i think where demi gods are praying that you give your own the nectar of your own lotus feet so 
if a jiva approaches the lord some way or the other then the lord wants to see that some way he gets the taste of that relationship along with whatever he wanted except you know uh, that because he he wants that that relationship get established while someone who doesn't approach the lord only then the lord is unable to offer him that but when someone approaches him then some way he wants to develop that relationship where his kindness and the sweetness is experienced by the jiva and the person who is approaching with motive and without motive are not giving the same amount of pleasure to the lord that is also in many verses of bhagavatam uh, in one uh, third canto purport propad writes that sakama bhaktas they are not as they are not satisfying the lord like the nishkama you know devotees so the lord becomes very pleased and he gives himself to those who are nishkama so the way the lord feels pleasure in his heart from the both the devotees is different that's why when the devotees are told that we should look for pure motive even here dhruva is rem- repenting so finally as we understand the purity of the lord's heart and the sweetness of the lord's heart lord selflessness then the devotee will feel that repentance for his motive so before and tell that prabhu if you are with a good motive then it will be useful to have a sweetness and lord will get more pleasure but because lord is actually wanting to get the devotee back he will purify that heart and also get him so he is still satisfied that he is at least coming to me good thank you yes sir sunan Roji, there is no end to the. Uh, at no point of time one can tell that now the motive is that the peakish. This is the highest level of motive. There is nothing beyond it, and even in the case of service also, there is no end and no limit to it. So, uh, when a demon renders some service to the Lord, even if it's without proper motive, at least he is somewhere doing something. So the Lord becomes pleased with his effort at his level, and he accepts the he accepts the service. but in case of a devotee the lord wants to make sure that he makes progresses and and lord has more expectation from him like in case of putana she was a demon so though she did not have proper motive the lord accepted but in case of dhruva maharaj he is already considered to be more elevated and lord has got more expectation from him so that's the reason lord expects him to be more pure and here uh, the motive is also being taken into consideration by the lord okay good thank you we find that in the bhagavad gita krishna is uh, when he speaks about these uh, four types of devotees chaturvedha vajanvana jana sukrutino arjuna artho jignyasur arthati gyani so he says amongst these four the gyani is the best is most dear why the commonly is to become a desireless it is to be understood that the meaning should not be desireless for anything for a sense gratification ओकेस्टर्बेंसो so that so uh, that's how uh, even though the lord appreciates so the lord says all so the gyani is the most dear why because he has no desires therefore he is most dear but as far as the remaining three three are concerned the lord says still they are also dear they are udaradi they are also magnanimous because at least they are coming to me and so there are different levels ultimately the lord wants and if you go to the 12th chapter you find such a big variety and such a big range of devotional service which the lord is ready to accept right in that entire section between 8 to 12 of the 12th chapter krishna is saying okay if you are not at the topmost platform where your mind can be totally fixed on me then follow the regulative principles if that is also not possible do some work for me if that is also not possible somehow somehow sacrifice the fruits of activities do something and get connected to me that is how the lord is giving every jeeva a chance to somehow get connected to krishna and get purified ultimately and in all those verses krishna says ultimately he'll come to me in all those verses so yes yeah, so everyone is being given a chance but everyone is not having the same reciprocation with the lord and so 
those who have material desires krishna says okay they are udaradi the gyani he still has some desire for liberation but he has no material desires so therefore he is definitely more dear and he krishna says he is as good as my own self the gyani he says is as good as my own self now if we go to the bhagavatam 11th canto when he speak to uddhav krishna tells him that he is more dear to me than my own self and even lakshmi and brahma and shiva even they are not as dear but a devotee like you uddhav you are more dear to me than my own self so you see the different gradations so yes so yes krishna is ready to accept the service krishna is ready to accept motive whatever it may be krishna is ready to accept somehow get purified krishna is ready to accept all that but the way he reciprocates with the devotee is not the same and that's what we saw in the previous purport also here uh, prabhupad is writing the way the dictation which krishna gives to the non devotee to the devotee is not the same in one lecture also prabhupad is saying what how the lord reciprocates with the surrendered and the unsurrendered it is not the same so the reciprocation the proximity that all varies according to the the motive the service the quality of service so then everything varies but krishna is giving a chance to us that is my answer would you like to say something uh so basically the statement is in context of like uh, dhruv maharaj rendering service although the motive was impure it's not like an absolute thing. there are variations in that yes uh we saw that heavy emphasis uh, i mean our dhruv maharaj feeling lamentation and then we discussed about that but uh, i was just wondering our shil bhakti and sarsad maharaj talks about the balam rice concept also where he says that you know that the guru Uh, kind of engages the disciple and somehow encourages him so and where do you find a balance or how do we kind of transit from one to another because it's easy to read is easy to even like kind of discuss but when it come to practice of not being attached to service or being you know satisfied it really i mean it it takes certain degree of or rather a large degree of advancement to really relate to that and be satisfied because you know here we see that at times the uh, issues about i want to do this particular service in this way only and only and this is all like you know direct service to the lord sometimes the deity is directly so then it becomes really an understandable that how do we a service a person feels i am doing to please only and at the same time it's causing some kind of upheaval at some level uh, so yesterday we had a meeting in some group so but like uh, you know somebody is expert in, he or she want to do something and at the same time you know there are other challenges which are created so become difficult how to manage that how to deal with that when uh when individual feels this is what best i am doing it for the lord only but at the same time others don't perceive it that way so how to really resolve that i uh, mm. whatever ultimately at that point of time these things are in my understanding very very dynamic and uh, so much depends on the person the service the track record the intentions motivation so many factors come into play and uh, as you rightly said that things could become very confusing very bewildering and there may not be mathematical equations to come up with an exact solution to such varying problems my understanding is therefore that so much depends in such situations on how the super soul inspires us to come to the right decision the best example in this connection is how arjuna dealt with ashwatthama very complicated situation correct all pure devotees absolutely pure devotees 
Krishna himself is present. Yet there are varied instructions. And Arjuna had to please everyone. Such a difficult situation. So there we know. It's mentioned. And Srila Prabhupada explains that so, Krish, so Arjuna had to use his own intelligence and come up with a decision. But because Arjuna was surrendered to Krishna, Krishna also gave him the intelligence to come to the right decision in such a conflicting situation. And so in such situations, that is the only solace. And therefore... At that time, in such situations, therefore, then when things go totally beyond our limited material intelligence, then it gives us a chance, a scope to take full shelter of the Lord and pray to the Lord. My dear Lord, I'm helpless. I cannot figure out. So please, only you can help. So that is the only way in which we can, I think, so Krishna creates such situations so that we increase our intensity of surrender. Otherwise, if everything simply works so easily according to our own um, intelligence, capabilities, experience, if everything can be figured out so simply and we, be and we become so expert in these things over a period of time, but then when such situations come, when everything looks so bewildering, then we are actually given an opportunity to actually take full shelter of the Lord. I'm sure many of us must may have heard that uh, pastime or an incident of the devotee cooking on Ekadashi. How many have heard this incident told by Zolnas Radha Maharaj in a lecture? It was an Ekadashi. It was a big feast. Anybody heard? No? Okay. This is very interesting. And uh, hopefully it will answer your question. So it was a festival in the US and um, hundreds of devotees, so many Prabhupada disciples, sannyasis. So big festival, three, four days festival. One of the days happened to be an Ikadashi. So on that Ekadashi, they were cooking a huge quantity of Ekadashi Sabji. And so there was a main cook who was cooking. There was an assistant who was helping him. So in between, the cook had to go out for getting something. So he told the assistant that please stir the Sabji so it doesn't get burnt. So as he was stirring, and he was looking at the Sabji, and he was thinking... This sabji looks very bland. You know, Ekadashi sabji, not much spice, no, no color, no haldi, no color. Looks very bland, right? Very colorless. You think not only taste should be good, the sabji should also look good, should look good. Even the in every aspect, prashad should be, should look good, taste good, feel good, everything should be good. So I think this is looking very bland. So he went to the refrigerator. He opened the refrigerator and he saw huge quantity of peas, green peas, so colorful green peas. He was very happy. So he took the bag of green peas. He put it in the sabji. And it looked so colorful. He was so happy. Wow, this is great. Now devotees will be so happy. So the main cook came back. And he said, he looked at the sabji. What is this? The assistant said, peace. The main cook said, peace. What's the problem? So don't you know this is Ekadashi? So what? 
So Ekadashi, it is said no grains, no beans, where it is said no peas. It's totally frustrated. What to do now? Very soon the serving time is going to come. There's no time to cook another sabji. So what to do? So he went to some of the senior devotees and said, what to do? They said, your problem, you deal with it. Not our problem. And so finally when the prasadam serving time came and the sabji was being served, so it, before the serving took place, he took the mic and he announced that we have a humble request. As the sabji is being served, we request you to please remove the peas before eating the sabji. What else to do? So just see, now that cook, the head cook, the main cook could be the most expert cook in the entire world, universe. But if Krishna inspires the assistant to put peas in that sabji, who can do anything? Where is the scope? Where is the role of our expertise? That's how Krishna could totally humble the most expert person if Krishna wants to do that. And there are enough examples of that. Uh, in one place, you know, they made grand, grand arrangement for a festival. Huge pandal, VIPs, this, that, so many. Everything was set up. And a cyclone came and took the pandal away. What to do? Nothing can be done. How much ever we may scratch our heads and break our brains, what can be done? This is how Krishna teaches everyone. You are insignificant. That is how Krishna forces the jiva to take shelter of the Lord and with folded hands, with bowed heads, pray before the Lord, my dear Lord, I am simply an insignificant fool. If you desire, I can render some service. If you don't desire, I am helpless. This is how Krishna helps the living entity come to that realization. This is his mercy. And so therefore, when we are put in such situations, then this is our only shelter. And this is what Krishna wants us. Wants us to come to his shelter and give up our own thoughts of our own greatness and our own abilities and come to the conclusion that Krishna, I am yours. That's my small understanding. I'm sure you have much better realizations on the topic. But... Huh? Is that not Ekadashi stuff? The matter which we use, the green peas. They're not taking on Ekadashis? No. Uh -huh. That was the news also. <laughs> I also didn't know because I never cooked them. Okay. <laughs> Okay, fine. Question? Okay. Usually we see that this 
uh, Dhruva Maharaj case, actually Lord fulfilled the desires. Initially, he may had uh, he had the revengeful attitude towards his uh, stepmother, and and Lord fulfilled. And Dhruva Maharaj is repenting for that. Now uh, we see that uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that Ami Vigya Visakena Diva. So although Sadaka may have material desires, he is performing devotional service. So Lord has Lord may purify it. A Lord may fulfill, may not fulfill it. In case of Dhruva Maharaj, he fulfilled the desires. And although at this position, Dhruva Maharaj was purified, and he was actually at that point he was not desiring that, but still Lord fulfilled. So how to understand this? Uh, so it is completely upon the free, uh, Supreme Lord. He may like to fulfill the desire of Sadaka, or he may he may not, depending upon. Oh no. Right, depending upon that devotee. Okay. So just like in one of the purports, Shri Prabhupada wrote that Krishna, he gave Dhruva Maharaj the opulence because he knew that even after getting the opulence, he will not give up his devotional service. So therefore he gave. And sometimes, yes, yaham manugrinnami harishetad dhanam shanai. So this is also Krishna's mercy. That is also Krishna's mercy. How Krishna will reciprocate with this devotee, how will he reciprocate with that devotee and how will he reciprocate with that devotee it is totally Krishna's prerogative and Krishna's independence. And But one thing we have to be convinced and that is Surudam Sarva Bhutanam. So we have that faith and conviction that whatever Krishna is doing in everyone's life is for the best benefit of that jiva. And what is the best benefit of that jiva? Krishna knows best and he deals with accordingly. Right. Okay. Okay. Ji, how do we know what is the difference between a, a desire and a motive? Why I'm asking, like, sometimes intellectually we may get a, like, we may fight it out. Some desire came and then we say, I don't want it. But like one acts by one's modes almost inadvertently. So when one is doing an action, whether it is motivated from pure devotional service or from the desire which apparently came. Intellectually, one may have debated and discussed on that point in the mind only. You may have just fought it out. But when is, one is acting, in what spirit is acting, how the motive gets defined? Because modes are so imperceptible at that moment. So if devotional service done with a motive causes repentance later, when it causes this kind of problem. So. We want pure devotional motive to be there, even a material desire may remain for like some time to get washed away. I mean, the desire is there and one is fighting it. But how to keep that motive very clear? Means we have to distinguish at least the motive is right or not in the action. Correct. So therefore, what is the motive? Therefore, in the definition of pure devotional service, Anya Abhilash Ita. The Ita defines the motive. So one may have abhilash, but if the motive is correct, then it is acceptable. So if uh, the examples are given, so somebody is calling out to the Lord for help. So somebody is uh, somebody is uh, um, maybe going to going to slip and fall, or somebody is uh, um, um, maybe facing. Um, a very dangerous situation, a very precarious situation. One calls out to the Lord for help. That's a desire. But then what is the motive? So why I want to save my life? I want to save my life because I want to serve. That's a pure motive. But if there is some other motive besides that, then that's a contamination. So now your question is how to discern our own motive. Definitely, as it is said, that... Uh, um, we know, all know the famous example. Put a black spot on a black cloth, it's not visible. But the same black spot on a white cloth, it is visible. So therefore, to the degree we are pure, we can discern the black spot. Therefore, on our own, it is very difficult. And therefore, if, if one, therefore, Prabhupada again and again speaks about sincerity. So when there is sincerity to get purified, then Krishna sees that sincerity and he helps the sadhaka discern. But if the sincerity itself is lacking, then Krishna allows. Okay, go ahead. 
go ahead with your motives go ahead with your plans and then at a later time at the right time then krishna strikes so that the person understands oh that was wrong so so much is based on one sincerity therefore prabhupada again and again repeatedly he writes about sincerity so when that sincerity is there then krishna reciprocates accordingly and of course being influenced by the modes it's very difficult to discern the yellow spectacles and therefore the importance of taking guidance so if we have doubts whether this is going this is i'm going on the right track wrong track if it's difficult to discern best is to take some guidance and seek okay thank you very much for the discussion anyway um, uh, so that the those online don't feel we are neglecting them so anyone online has any questions or comments okay fine so we are going to the last section of the chapter where there is not a much philosophical discussion but it is just the description of how dhruva maharaj comes back to his father's palace and uh, and what happens there so so we will just read the translations now rapidly so every devotee can read two two translations and we will proceed ahead if there is some discussion in between we will discuss okay so we'll uh, begin with uh, daujana dakku so this is um, text 37 when king ustan pad heard that his son dhruva was Maybe this volume back. can be raised little bit because there is lot of noise Hare Hare Krishna. when king uttan pad heard that his son dhruva was coming back home as if coming back to life after death he could not put his faith in this message for he was doubtful of how it could happen he considered himself the most wretched and therefore he thought that it was not possible for him to attain such a good fortune shlok 38 although he could not believe the words of the messenger he had full faith in the word of the great sage narada thus he was greatly overwhelmed by the news and he immediately offered the messenger a highly valuable necklace in great satisfaction then king uttanabad been very eager to see the face of his lost son mounted a chariot drawn by excellent horses and bedecked with golden filigree taking with him many learned brahmanas all the elderly personalities of his families his officer his minister and his immediate friend he immediately left the city as he proceeded in this parade there was a, there were auspicious sound of council cattle drums flutes and the chanting of vedic mantra to indicate all good fortune both the queen of king uttanapa namely suniti and suruchi along with his other son uttama appeared in the procession the queen was seated on a palanquin so here there is an important point prabhupada writes suniti out of her great compassion and due to being the mother of a great vaishnav did not hesitate to take the other wife suruchi and her son uttama on the same palanquin that was the greatness of queen suniti the mother of the great vaishnav dhruva maharaj so there was no envy uh, because of the suruchi so much trouble so much problem everything happened because of suruchi and her son but now no envy no malice no anger she is ready to take both suruchi and her son together mm, that is the greatness very difficult mm, to practice this but that is the greatness of vaishnav mm. advaishta sarvabhuta naam no envy please come upon seeing dhruva maharaj approaching the neighboring small forest king uttanpad with great haste got down from his chariot he had been very anxious for a long time to see his son dhruva and therefore with great love and affection he went forward to embrace his lost long lost boy breathing very heavily the king embraced him with both arms but dhruva maharaj was not the same as before he was completely sanctified by spiritual advancement due to having been touched by the lotus feet of the supreme personality of godhead reunion with dhruva maharaj fulfilled king uttanpad's long cherished desire and for this reason he smelled dhruva's head again and again 
and bathed him with torrents of very cold tears. Then Rumaraj, the foremost of all nobles, first of all offered his obeisances at the feet of his father and was honored by his father with various questions. He then bowed his head at the feet of his two mothers. Okay, so again we see Dhruva Maharaj. He is bowing his head at the feet of both the mothers, including his stepmother. So why is that so? Prabhupada writes, the answer is that after achieving perfection by self-realization and seeing the Supreme Personality of Godhead face to face, Dhruva Maharaj was completely freed from all contamination of material desire. Feelings of insult or honor in this material world are never perceived by a devotee. Not so easy. Hmm? But then Prabhupada quotes Trinada Pisuni Chena Tarora Piso Hishnuna after that. So the pure devotee is the noblest of all, and he has no feelings of animosity towards anyone. Duality due to animosity is a creation of this material world. So we already discussed on that friends, enemies is on the bodily concept. Next. Suruchi, the younger mother of Dhruva Maharaj, seeing that the innocent boy had fallen at her feet, immediately picked him up, embracing him with her hands, and with tears of feeling, she blessed him with the words, My dear boy, long may you live. So because Dhruva is behaving like that towards Suruchi, then Suruchi is also reciprocating accordingly. She is also ready to bless Dhruva. And the next verse is an important verse. Yasya prasanno bhagavan guner metriyadi bhirhari tasmai namanti bhutani nimnam aap ivasvayam. Unto one who has transcendental qualities, due to friendly behavior with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, all living entities offer honor just as water automatically flows down by nature. This verse is quoted. In the Nectar of Devotion, I mean, it's not quoted, but the Acharyas quote this verse in the discussion on the six characteristics of pure devotional service. When the second characteristic, <clears throat> what is that? Shubhadha. So under Shubhadha, there are four aspects of Shubhadha. Anybody remembers? Okay. Sadguna, Sukhada means higher happiness. Sadguna is all the divine qualities come. And uh, Prinanam. Uh, hmm. Sarva Jagatam Prinanam. Sarva Jagata Prinanam and, and Anuraktata. Anuraktata. Okay, so the, the devotee, the pure devotee, Sarva Jag Jagata Prinanam. So he, he thinks about the entire worlds because he sees everything and everyone in relationship to the Supreme Lord. And at the same time, Anuraktata means he attracts everyone. Because he is thinking about the welfare of everyone, then he also attracts everyone towards him. And so in that connection, the same verse is quoted about Dhruva Maharaj. So because Dhruva Maharaj, he has no envy, no animosity. He is thinking about the welfare of everyone. So therefore, everyone also becomes attracted towards him. And that is how Suruchi also, because of the wonderful qualities of Dhruva, she gave up her animosity. And she is now able to bless Dhruva. As Prabhupada writes, since Dhruva Maharaj was blessed by the Lord due to his transcendental qualities, everyone was bound to offer him all respects and benedictions just as water by its nature flows down. A devotee of the Lord does not demand respect from anyone, but wherever he goes, he is honored by everyone throughout the whole world with all respects. And then quoting the six Goswamis, Dhira Adhira Jana Priyo. Because a devotee having pleased the Supreme Personality of God is the source of all emanations, automatically pleases everyone and thus everyone offers him respects. And that's what we see in the case of Srila Prabhupada. How Srila Prabhupada was respected by everyone because Srila Prabhupada loved everyone. Please continue. The two brothers Uttama and Dhruva Maharaj also exchanged their tears. They were overwhelmed by the ecstasy of love and affection. And when they embraced one another, the hair on their bodies stood up. Suniti, the real mother of Dhruva Maharaj, embraced the tender body of her son, who was dearer to her than her own life, and thus forgot all material grief, for she was very pleased. 
Vishnachak Thakur says that Dhruva Maharaj met his mother last. You can see in the previous verses, he met his stepmother and father and every, everyone else. He met his mother last because the mother was actually unconscious. Hmm. Because of, uh, you know, she was so much in, in happiness that her son has come back. She actually fainted. And so therefore he meets her last. Okay. My dear Vidura, Suniti was the mother of a great hero. Her tears, together with the milk flowing from her breasts, wet the whole body of Dhruva Maharaj. This was a great auspicious sign. So Prabhupada writes, this was like an Abhishek. Water, milk. So he says, this auspiciousness of the Abhishek ceremony performed by his beloved mother was an indication that in the very near future, Dhruva Maharaj would be installed on the throne of his father. This Abhishek ceremony performed by his beloved mother was an indication that he would occupy the throne of Maharaj Uttanapad. And the next paragraph, a devotee is also a great hero because he conquers the influence of Maya. In, uh, in the fourth canto purport, in the section of King Prachin Parishad, Daishal Prabhupada writes, there are two types of heroes. One is a material hero who becomes great by material achievements. And the other type of hero is on the spiritual platform, a Goswami who totally controls the senses. So two types of heroes. Please continue. The residents of the palace praise the queen. Dear queen, your beloved son was lo lost a long time ago and it is your good, great fortune that he now has come back. It appears, therefore, that your son will be able to protect you for a very long time and will put an end to all your material pangs. Dear Queen, you must have worshipped the Supreme Personality Godhead who delivers his devotees from the greatest danger. Persons who constantly meditate upon him surpass the course of birth and death. This perfection is very difficult to achieve. Here, yeah, Srila Prabhupada writes an important point that how at home his mother prayed to the supreme lord for his safety and good fortune in other words the lord was worshipped by both mother and son and both were able to achieve the supreme benediction from the supreme lord that is sudur jayam no one can conquer death so that's very significant so both were praying and so therefore both got the benefits please continue the sage matra continued my dear Vidura, when everyone was thus praising Dhruv Maharaj, the king was very happy and he had Dhruva and his brothers seated on the back of a she-elephant. Thus he returned to his capital where he was praised by all classes of men. The whole city was decorated with columns of banana trees containing bunches of fruits and flowers and betel nut trees with leaves and branches were seen here and there. There were also many gates set up which were structured to give the appearance of sharks. At each and every gate, there were burning lamps and big water pots decorated with differently colored cloth, strings of pearls, flower garlands, and hanging mango leaves. In the capital city, there were many palaces, city gates, and surrounding walls, which were already very, very beautiful. And on this occasion, all of them were decorated with golden ornaments. The domes of the city palaces glittered, as did the domes of the beautiful airplanes which hovered over the city. All the quadrangles, lanes, and streets in the city and the raised sitting places at the crossings were thoroughly cleansed and sprinkled with sandalwood water. And auspicious grains such as rice and barley and flowers, fruits, and many other auspicious presentations were scattered all over the city. Thus, as Dhru Maharaj passed on the road from every place from every place in the neighborhood, all the gentle household ladies assembled to see him and out of material affection, they offered their blessings, showering him with white mustard seeds, mustard seed, barley, curd, water, newly grown grass, fruits and flowers. In this way, Dhru Maharaj, while hearing the pleasing songs sung by the ladies, entered the palace of his father. Dhru Maharaj thereafter lived in his uh, father's palace, which had walls bedecked with highly valuable jewels. 
His affectionate father took particular care of him, and he dwelled in that house just as the demigods live in their palaces in the higher planetary systems. The bedding in that in the palace was as white as the foam of milk and was very soft. The bedsteads were made of ivory with embellishments of gold, and the chairs, benches, and other sitting places and furniture were made of gold. The palace of the king was surrounded by walls made of marble with many engravings made of valuable jewels like sapphires which depicted beautiful women with shining jewel lamps in their hands. The king's residence was surrounded by gardens wherein there were varieties of trees brought from the heavenly planets. In those trees there were pairs of sweetly singing birds and almost mad bumblebees which made a very relishable buzzing sound. There were emerald staircases which led to lakes full of variously colored lotus flowers and lilies, and swans and karandavas, chakravakas, cranes and similar other valuable birds were visible in those lakes. The saintly king Uttanapad, hearing of the glorious deeds of Dhruva Maharaj and personally seeing also how influential and great he was, felt very satisfied, for Dhruva's actors were wonderful to the supreme degree. Here an important statement Prabhupada writes, because of his spiritual qualifications, he became very popular among the citizens. He must have performed many wonderful activities by the grace of the Lord. No one is more satisfied than the father of a person who is credited with glorious activities. Okay, so also we find in the instructions of the Lord to Prithu Maharaj, he says that by actually performing devotional service according to the instructions of the previous Acharyas, one can actually satisfy all the citizens. So actually, because the Lord is satisfied, then everyone becomes satisfied. So therefore, it is actually by spiritual qualifications, one can satisfy everyone. Please continue. When, uh, when after concentration, King Uttanapad saw that Dhruva Maharaj was suitably mature to take charge of the kingdom and, that's the, and that his ministers were agreeable and the citizens were also very fond of him, he enthroned Dhruva as the emperor of this planet. Okay, an important point. Although it is misconceived that formerly the monarchical, monarchical government was autocratic, from the description of this verse it appears that not only was King Uttanapad the Rajarishi, but before installing his beloved son Dhruva on the throne of the empire of the world, he consulted his ministerial officers, considered the opinion of the public, and also personally examined Dhruva's character. Then the king installed him on the throne to take charge of the affairs of the world. So he was not autocratic that he took a decision independently, but he consulted the ministers, he saw the public opinion, he personally examined, then he installed him. So, and then later on we find Dhruva does exactly the same thing before installing the next king. He also, there also Prabhupada writes the same point. He was not autocratic. So that is the way of good governance. One is not autocratic, but then one consults everyone before taking important decisions. And the last verse. After considering his advanced age and deliberating on the welfare of his spiritual self, King Uttanapada detached himself from worldly affairs and entered the forest. Okay, so in this way, King Uttanapad, he installs Dhruva Maharaj on the throne and he went to the forest. So Prabhupada writes that um, as Maharaj Dhruva practiced austerity in his early age, his father Maharaj Uttanapad in his old age also practiced austerity in the forest. Sometimes one has to practice. But uh, in modern days, however, it is not possible to give up one's home and go to the forest to practice austerity. But if people of all ages would take shelter of the Krishna consciousness movement and practice the simple austerities of no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling and no meat eating and chant the Hare Krishna mantra regularly 16 rounds by this practical method, it would be a very easy task to get salvation from this material world. Thus in the Bhagavan purports of the fourth canto nine chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Dhru Maharaj Return Song. Okay, so thank you very much. So this is the end of the ninth chapter and uh, 
So the 10th and the 11th chapter is the fight of Dhruva Maharaj with the Yakshas. The 10th chapter is extremely short without any purports, not much purports. So both of them have the same theme. So we'll cover the 10th and the 11th chapters on Tuesday. Okay, so Monday being Ekadashi, we won't have class. On Tuesday, we'll cover the 10th and 11th chapters. And on Wednesday and Thursday, we'll be covering the 11th and the 12th chapters. That's how we'll proceed. Thank you all very much. Kanadra Shimad Bhagutam ki jai, Shula Prabhupada ki jai, Samvedh Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki jai.